that is what makes the image feel so alive. If you take this one, you can see that the light is right here, right? It's the brightest part of the image. All the fog is showing you that the light is right there. It gets darker as we move away. It also gets cooler. So we can see that that's where the light is. For this one here, you know, the, the sun is in the frame. For here, the sun is in the frame. Here, the moon is in the frame. So these are a little bit easier to identify where the light is just because the light source is actually in the photo. But, you know, just because the light source is in the photo doesn't mean it feels like it's in the photo, right? What we need to do... Today, I'm talking to Jeff Lewis, a landscape artist from Marin County, California. Uh, he is the founder of Escape, the world's first weather service for photographers. And he leads a community of over 200 photographers in the San Francisco Bay Area. These are some of the very best photographers in the city. And uh, Jeff's work has attracted clients like Adobe, Backpacker, uh, Nature Conservancy. His work is uh, frequently displayed in uh, various galleries and exhibitions around the city. And uh, he's one of 12 artists in the U.S., who was featured in Adobe's Global Creative Cloud launch. If you look at Jeff's work, you would think he has a million followers, but he has none. And that's because he's not on social media. Regardless of what level you are at in photography or what genre of photography that you practice, you will definitely benefit a lot from this episode your perspective as an artist will expand. Uh, so I really hope that every photographer watches this episode with Jeff and he demonstrates how you can bring out the life in your photos, not by spending hours of editing and messing around with the sliders in Lightroom and Photoshop. In fact, he shows how you can finish an edit in less than 30 seconds. But by selling the light, uh, you can really breathe life and emotion into your photographs. In his own words, Jeff says, we are living in an age where audiences can be purchased on Instagram. Unique compositions are needles in a haystack and low quality Photoshop jobs are a dime a dozen. In contrast, I pride myself on professional, personal and emotional storytelling. My studio albums are not merely images I think others will enjoy, but rather seek to tell a story, often my story, something I feel is commonly missing from landscape art. I passionately seek out scenes those before me have ignored and ask, why not? A lot of us have heard you say, sell the light. I think mm -hmm. it's kind of synonymous to Jeff now almost. Yeah. Um, yeah, even we have we are on our Slack on our Slack teams. We even have like you know little emojis that are we say sell the light and sell yeah. the light. Yeah. Why is that important? I know I know you we talked about you know photography yeah. you know light writing with light is an important yeah. is what photography is about. Uh, but this notion of selling the light, can you just yeah. elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. Let me actually let me pull something up for you. This is an example of a beer stop painting. A lot of us photographers are familiar with this guy, right? I mean, this, this is his vision of Yosemite Valley. And this vision of selling the light is not something that landscape photographers invented. It's something that's been around for decades, centuries. And this one is just classic to me. It's just this gorgeous view of Yosemite from 1864. And it, it sells the light perfectly. You know, you have a big light source right here in the sun then all the mountains are reflecting it. You see the light here, the light in the foreground. Everything is just showing you that this light source is here and it makes the image feel so alive. And, you know, a painter chooses this moment to make his painting, right? This is the light that he chooses. And as photographers, we choose the light that makes our shot. And this is a, this is a thing that portrait photographers have known for a long time. And any portrait photographer will, you know, you can look at any good portrait, any good studio shot, and any any photographer worth their salt will always be able to tell you how it was lit. Right? Yeah. Oh, they used a softbox, then you know, flash, you know, a flash softened from the right, then you know, there's a key light, there's a key light from here, and there's a nice rim light that's lighting up the model's head, you know, from that side. And like you it, you just learn your fundamentals of lighting, right? That's because again, we're talking about photography, 
what is it? It is writing with light. That is what that is what this is. And right. the reason is that the light is what is making this scene special in the first place. If you have no light, then you know it, you would a photograph without light would be a pretty postmodern definition of a photo, right? It's it could be argued that it is a photo if you have a black screen, but you know it's it usually wouldn't be very interesting to viewers. We would, you know, we capture moments of light that are spectacular to us. Even just if I'm like, if we're talking about our own setup on, you know, our own setup on video calls here, we want the lighting to look flattering. You know, it makes or breaks anything. Yeah. If I'm if I'm designing a home, any interior designer, any architect will tell you just how pivotal it is to have good lighting in your space. It is just, it is absolutely essential in anything. And so as photographers, light is what makes the scene special. It's what draws us to it in the first place, whether you realize it or not. And this goes for grand landscapes, just like the Bierstadt painting I showed. It also goes for, you know, it goes for smaller scenes as well. I can go through a couple of, um, go through a couple of my photos. Let me just, uh, I'll just pull up my portfolio here. If you look at pretty much any of these photos, if I point to them, you should be able to literally point to the light source in them and tell me where it's coming from, right? Like this this image here, you, sh you can tell that the light is coming from the left. And yeah. specifically, it's the left horizon, right? It's not coming from way up in the sky. It's coming from right here near just off to the left in the horizon. And the sky shows you that. It gets darker as it goes away. The hills all tell you that. They're all lit from the left side, right? The, the right sides are all in shadow. And it's brighter over here than it is down here. So we kind of, we build in this light source. And we that, that way I'm able to convince you that the light is here. And that that is what makes the image feel so alive. If you take this one, you can see that the light is right here, right? It's the brightest part of the image. All the fog is showing you that the light is right there. It gets darker as we move away. It also gets cooler. So we can see that that's where the light is. For this one here, you know, the, the sun is in the frame. For here, the sun is in the frame. Here, the moon is in the frame. So these are a little bit easier to identify where the light is just because the light source is actually in the photo. But, you know, just because the light source is in the photo doesn't mean it feels like it's in the photo, right? What we need to do is actually sell that light source and to convince someone looking at the photo that that is the light source. And what that means, that needs to be the brightest thing in the image. It needs to fall off as we move away from that light source. And what I just said is actually problematic to a lot of photographers. And I know one of the questions that you were thinking about asking was, what is a mistake that I often see in other photographers' work? And, you know, the first thing we do with a lot of these photos is, well, we'll drop the highlights way down. <laughs> and you know, we'll recover our like, you know, we'll recover the area around the sun a lot and make it, you know, we'll dim it. And well, that's a problem because when you do that, it doesn't feel like a light source anymore, right? It's, it's not bright. It's supposed to be bright. It's a light source. That's the whole point. So, you know, it's like, I would, I challenge these notions that are often the first things that we learn as landscape photographers that you know no you don't need to recover your highlights all the way you know it's it's okay to blow things out this image is actually completely blown out right here it's fine it makes that that's part of what makes it feel alive and it has a light so that's that's, that's what i mean by selling the light and you know it it also goes for smaller scenes you know you're shooting intimate scenes again if you're if you're drawn to a leaf or a fly, you know, a bee on a bee pollinating a flower or some you know, a bird flying by, you're not going to be drawn to it at any time of day in any angle, right? You're drawn to it in a specific way because the light was perfect, and that is what makes the photo. So your job as a as an artist is to bring that light to life, and I call that selling the light. So, yeah. So, so you're saying that it's it's totally fine if certain areas of your photo, especially the the areas where the light is, is totally blown out. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. Um, oftentimes, for me, the ideal image 
usually has a well-controlled light source, so it will be just shy of clipping. And I often do this in my photos where I'll, I'll use, you know, the histograms, we have scopes, we use, we have other tools that will tell us, you know, when something is completely blowing, when I've lost detail, and I'll often raise it until it's just below that point. And that's usually perfect. Again, there's nothing wrong with blowing out a small area. Some portrait photographers, especially, they'll blow out the entire sky, right? It makes their yeah. subject stand out. And it makes it feel very alive in 3D because you have this this feeling of light and dimension that comes with it. So, right. you know, there's, and this goes against everything that we're taught from the start as landscape photographers, right? Where you want the maximum dynamic range in your photo and all yeah. the detail and you want to recover all your shadows. And, you know, if you do that, it's just, it feels dead and drab because you took away the light that made the scene special in the first place. Right. So it's definitely something that we need to be careful and conscious of and again, this is something that I discovered myself many years ago because I wasn't satisfied with the way my photos were looking when I was following the advice that I was given. And I realized that the advice I was given wasn't right. In terms of selling the light, um, what is, what's something that you have to be aware of when shooting the scene? Uh, and and I'm not talking about, yeah, you know, your composition and everything. Um, you figure out that part. But is there anything in particular regarding selling the light that you should be concerned with? When you're when you're taking the photo. Yeah, when you're taking the photo. So oftentimes you're going to already be doing it subconsciously because if you're drawn to a scene, again, this goes back to the arts versus crafts, right? If you're drawn to a scene just because you've seen it before and you're taking the photo that you've seen before, then it might not have optimal lighting because maybe the other person shot it at a different time of year when the sun was different or the lighting was a little different, right? I mean, it's just different conditions that made it special. And a lot of my photos these days, you know, you could go to the same place at the same time of day and same time of year and you might, you won't get anything that looks like that because it's, it was a special moment that I captured and there was, that was what that day offered, right? So if you're doing that and really capturing what is offered to you, then you probably are already capturing images that have dynamic light in them because that's why you're drawn to them in the first place. So really all you need to do in post-processing is bring that out rather than, you know, turning it down. Yeah. I know you can't have a photo without light, but mm -hmm. is there ever a time you think that a photo might work without the light being sold? I have seen very few. And again, this goes across all genres, all types of photos, big scenes, small scenes. There's just, you almost always want to have something. And I'm... Um, and this includes can... abstracts as well? Yes, absolutely. I'm seeing if I can... I didn't actually have an abstract here unless you have one. I'm trying to pull one up. Yeah, that's a great question. So here's an example of a photo that, you know, maybe is not as obvious that, you know, we would need to sell a light source here. But yeah. if you look at the... If you look at kind of these little ridges, they do indicate that there kind of is a light. And I believe it was coming from this side. So what we can do is really emphasize that in our processing. And the first thing I'll do is um, set it to our medium rare profile. And we can, you know, we can talk more about that another time or later. But that really kind of helps restore the scene to the way I actually shot it. Because, you know, it kind of imports dark in the Lightroom. So what I do is I'm just going to start building in a couple, you know, radio filters that will really hammer in the fact that the light is coming from, you know, off to this side. And again, not notice that I'm warming it a little bit. I'm also pulling up the white point and I'm really going until things are just about clipping. And if I turn these on and off, you can see just the huge impact that it has on the image, that it makes it feel so much more alive. And this isn't a scene that I normally would have considered to use this on. And yeah. just to like, just to remind you that we literally, we process this image in 30 seconds. 
I mean, <laughs> there are some more things that can be done, but all our sliders are at zero. We process we process image in literally 30 seconds, and that's the transformation that we got. And you know, there this is a big part of my workflow where I don't use any fancy toolkits and Photoshop. You can see my my Photoshop does not have any fancy toolbars or anything. There's, I mean, if I just, if I open an image, there's, I don't have any of these, you know, fancy action panels or anything. I don't use layers of luminosity masks. I don't use any of that. And there's a reason for that, which is that my workflow is based on achieving more by doing less. And mm. oftentimes we create these problems for ourselves. And, you know, I can demonstrate that for you. If I, you know, if I drop the highlights and I boost the shadows, well, now this starts to feel flat. And, yeah. you know, then people add contrast to try to bring stuff out again. But now I'm changing my colors. You know, things are not going to be always identical, especially if you're in a scene that has that's more sensitive to exact color. Um, you know, if I'm shooting a sunset, I may see problems with the colors. Then I'm going to have to go into here and try to figure out, well, what's wrong with the colors? I'm going to have to make, you know, fancy luminosity selections in Photoshop to get exactly what I... But usually it's not necessary because nature did the hard work for us. Yeah. And we're kind of... We're often in this mindset that, you know, that we have to fight what nature is offering. And... The reality is that's that's not usually the case. You know, we don't necessarily need to insulate ourselves from what the photo actually looked like because there was a reason why we shot it then, right? We were drawn to that light and scene in the first place. So I do less to achieve more. And it's a huge, you know, really fundamental thing in my editing. And people see my photos, they, you know, they come over to, for processing sessions. You know, I do a lot of processing sessions here. I train a lot of the best photographers and they come over, they see my process and they're like, that's it. You know, where's, where's the rest? Where's all the layers and, you know, where's all the layers? Where's all the masks? Where's all this stuff? And I don't have it. I just, <laughs> you know, I start with, I start with a decent file. I sell the light with local adjustments, use our medium rare profiles. That's it. Don't need much else. And People are like, well, where's where's the magic? Where's the you know, where's how do you get it feeling 3D? The answer is the light. You know, there's no it's not using a mid-tones three luminosity mask at, you know, this fancy you don't you don't need that to produce great photos. It happens to be a great way to sell processing videos and photographers <laughs> love these things as cash cows, but the reality is you don't need all this stuff, especially with these new masks and lightroom that they just came out with last year, you know. You can do so much in so little time and it looks better because you don't create problems for yourself. So this is, again, this is what I really try to hammer into my clients and everybody who comes here, they, you know, they, they leave more confident because there's not much to memorize. You know, you don't have to do as much. You don't have, there's not as much to worry about. It's just that once you realize that a lot of the problems that you were encountering, you were creating for yourself. And that that proves to be very helpful. It's refreshingly inspiring and <laughs> surprising to be to, to be frank. I thought yeah. that you would have all the luminosity mask tools and uh, nothing. Looking and at your photos, it's, it's it seems what, like you're doing a lot. But <laughs> it's what separates me from a lot of other photographers out there, right? I mean, a lot of my work is just it's very simple. And in fact, I could even you see, I can try to find one um, one of these recent photos that. I'm just going to tear apart a little and show you what we did. Here's one of my favorite scenes from wow. a recent trip. This is um, the stuff in the redwoods of NorCal. And I'll show you what we've done to this. You can see that the file is a DNG. So we haven't, it hasn't even entered Photoshop. There's no Photoshop layers on here. There's nothing. Um, start with a profile. Again, this is just. Is that using your. We do sell uh, these on the, the, the we'll medium. More about medium. This. The medium, medium rare, medium, mm -hmm. what is it called? Medium rare? Yeah, medium rare. So we do sell medium these rare. profiles on our website and we can, we can go more into them. But basically what they do is they restore 
the image closer to the JPEG or the scene that you actually shot. And, you know, oftentimes your images will look great on the back of your camera, but when you come into Lightroom, they start to look much more, you know, dull and drab and they lose a lot. And there's a reason for it. And honestly, it's something that they probably should be applying when you import the photo, but they don't. So we apply it for you. And we, so we basically, we discovered this fix once we were sick of our flat and dull raw files. Um, because frankly, and this is already an edited file, there's already some masks on here, but if I just completely reset it, I don't find this file to be inspiring. So yeah. what we do is we have these profiles where now I can quickly look at the photos and I can say, well, this is inspiring to me. So it makes a big difference in, you know, it, it's, it's not a, it's not a style emulating preset. So it doesn't, it's not designed to be a one click and go thing. It's yeah. designed to give you a much better starting point from where you can really finish selling the light yourself and bring the image to life in the way that you want to. Is and, this uh, specific yeah. to Sony? It is right now. We're working on something for other manufacturers, but Sony is kind of, their files have tend to have a little worse colors straight out of uh, straight out of the raw. So we decided to fix those first. So we're on Sony, so we have the most files to test from, but we are working on other manufacturers as well. Would and, this work on Nikon as well since they use the same sensor? Uh, no, it doesn't because they actually mm. use different, they use slightly different color science on their, on their raw files. So um, you will find benefits, but it, it will actually overcook the files because the colors will, the colors are better straight out of the raw files on Nikon. So we're working on it. We will have a, I think we'll have a solution hopefully pretty soon, but yeah. So it, right now it's right now it's only Sony, but yeah, others are definitely coming and it really just, you know, it, when you, you know, when you're talking, when you import photos in the Lightroom, how they just, they look different. They look much more dull. And you're like, yeah. you come home, you, you're like, you were so, you were stoked when you were in the field. You're like, I took amazing photos. And you come back in the Lightroom, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's all I got, really? <laughs> so, because, you know, they, they look like this. And I remembered a much more vibrant scene. And there are scientific yeah. reasons for that. And what we're actually doing is we're applying some corrections for viewing images on digital monitors. So that's why they're so universal. And, w and why is it called medium are, rare? Where did the name come from? You're a vegetarian, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it comes from usually cooking meat. Usually a medium <laughs> rare is considered the best way to eat a steak. So we, okay. we decided nobody like nobody likes their meal raw. Nobody likes their steak raw. So we decided to have different levels of cooking because you want your food cooked perfectly, right? So we decided to call it medium rare, which is generally the generally seems the best way to cook food um, we also have a medium and a medium well which are great for you know other other applications as well oh, but, i would have never guessed that <laughs> <laughs> so going back to this photo again you can see the adjustments that i have on here literally i, I have the profile on i adjust the exposure i fix the white balance a little bit um the white balance is really important just allows me to get a a nice balance between the the warm and the cool tones in the image and also that, you know, not making it have too much of a magenta or a green cast. Just you're looking for a balance. It's called the white balance for a reason there. So otherwise, you know, just a little bright and washed out. So we dropped the exposure down. I saturated it just a little bit, not too much. And then the rest, everything is at zero. So, I mean, I do have a little bit of, you know, detail on here, but all the main sliders, you know, None of this, none of anything else. Do you normally not and do any global adjustments at all or? Very rarely. Just, okay. Mm. Very rarely. And you can see if I, if I turn down the highlights all the way. So, you know, it, it has certain effects on the light source. It actually dims the light source, which again, isn't necessarily a good thing because it doesn't make it feel as lively yeah. anymore. Right. And mm. if you look down in the foreground, kind of just pretend you're not seeing the light source at all. If I, if I just zoom into the foreground, and I turn the highlights down. Do you see how it feels much flatter and much less lively? Right. Well, right. now when I do that, well, it's no wonder that people have come up with all these methods for bringing contrast into the scene because the first thing they do is they remove it. Yeah. <laughs> so just be careful with stuff like that. Yeah. Um, after this, I just have a couple local adjustments. They're really all just, you know, radio filters to build in light sources. This one is 
bring up the exposure on you know these areas in the in the foreground a little bit not too much just a little bit do you normally use radial filters to to, to radio sell the filters, light. brushes, mm. grad filters. Yeah, they'll all, they'll all have their time in place. You know, radio mm. filters are great because a light source, usually it radiates from a light source. So it's a natural fit. But yeah, you can use brushes. You can use anything you want. And you notice a lot of the, the radials around the light source will often, I will often brighten it. I won't darken it because mm. it actually enhances the light source and makes it feel more 3D in the image. So. Isn't it? That's an ethereal yeah. feel as well. Yeah. Exactly. So I just brighten mm. up the light source and that's it. We have oh. a rod here and it's literally, I finished this photo in three minutes and it became one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, like you saw that, like when I showed you this photo, I bet you thought I spent hours editing this. You probably thought I spent so much time dialing the colors. Three days. In <laughs> yeah. Like you must think there's 30 layers in Photoshop on this file. There's yeah. not. And... Mm. People ask where the magic is, and the answer is just don't ruin the files that... When do you go to yeah. Photoshop, if at all? Usually for blending. Yeah. I used to use it a lot for... I used to use it for selling the light. I did a lot of manual brush work and, you know, stuff that was sensitive around selected areas. You know, if I had a hard selection line like the sky that I wanted to affect, I would use Photoshop. Now, most of that is obsolete because we have these new masks in Lightroom that do yeah. it for us. And those masks are fantastic. If you haven't updated your Lightroom, you got to do it. Or Camera right. Rod, the new Camera right. Rod has it as well. Yeah. And it's just, it's a, it's a complete game changer because it allows me to not even enter Photoshop for 80, 90% of images. You know, I have to use it for things like focus stacking for various kinds of blends when I want to bring something in from another exposure. Of course, I need Photoshop still. But, yeah. you know, other stuff, I can often get photos done in a couple minutes in Lightroom if I have it all in one shot. So, and you know, that it's much more inspiring to me that way because, you know, I'm a photographer, I'm an explorer. I like, when I see something on the back of my camera, I love it. You know, some people like we say, we're just collecting data out there, but in reality, we're, we should be doing more, right? We're having an experience and that translates into beautiful photos. And usually when I see a raw on the back of my camera with a JPEG preview, I it's pretty close to how I want the final result to look. You know, there might be a couple things that I need to change, of course, but like, usually it's, it's pretty good. So the, my processing is really just bringing out the things that need to be brought out to get me from, you know, that point to, to the finish line. And, you know, again, if the first thing you do is take a huge step back, well, of course you have a lot of work cut out for you because you took a huge step back at the start, right? So, yeah. Yeah, just be just be cognizant of that. Do you take breaks at all during your processing just to get that um uh, sometimes we lose that sense of judgment. Um Yeah, probably not as many as I should, but one mm -hmm. thing I do often do is I'll zoom way out on a photo. Um you know, view view it as if you're seeing it on a small screen just so that way you get when you do that you get to see kind of the big overall picture. It forces you not to focus on details. Mm -hmm. And showing it to someone else can really help whether that person is a photographer or not they'll have valuable input. And this is something we really stress on our escape members where, you know, we have people join and they see all these amazing photos and they're like, well, I'm not qualified to offer critiques on these photos. You know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable critiquing when, you know, this amazing photographer just gave their opinion on it and gave all these detailed info. And the reality is everybody has something value to contribute. And, you know, some of the best critiques I've ever gotten from my photos are from people who have never taken a photo on a fancy camera before. Mm. And, you know, the only photo, that, the only camera they've ever used is their phone. They're not a serious photographer. And they'll be able to tell me, they'll, they'll tell me different things, right? If I show, if you show your photo to me, I might be able to tell you, well, you, you need a couple points of warmth or, you know, your tint is a little far. Or you need to brighten up this little area and the shadows in the foreground. If you give your if you show your photo to a non photographer, you won't get that kind of critique. You'll hear, mm. "I love this. I don't like it. This makes me feel like I'm there. It feels like a painting." Mm. You, you'll get these kinds of critiques, and those are equally valuable because they will describe how your image actually makes someone feel. And if it isn't working for someone, there's usually a reason why, and if we kind of, then that's when I start, you know, challenging myself and I'm saying, well, 
I, well, why didn't this person like this photo? You know, why did it not make them feel like they were there? Maybe it's because I didn't sell the light enough. Maybe it's because it was too dark. Maybe it's because it was too green. You know, I'll, I'll try to, or maybe it's because the composition doesn't work. Maybe I'm too wide. Maybe they don't actually really feel like they're there because I tried to capture too much in the frame, right? There's, there's usually a reason why it's not working for them, even if they can't pinpoint exactly why. And yeah. a photographer with technical expertise might be able to help you dial in, okay, well, this is how you get the perfect colors in this area. This is, you know, the optimal brightness for these shadows, which is also extremely valuable, but it's different. So we all offer different kinds of expertise that evolve, you know, as we gain or as we gain experience in the field. And mm. again, they're all useful. They're all useful. And it's actually one of the best tips I could give a photographer. And you see this in my own work is that you never want to lose your beginner's mind. Where, yeah. you know, we often get, we see ourselves as sort of professionals after a while and we think, oh, well, you know, I don't need to take fun photos anymore, right? I don't need to, I, I just take professional landscapes. I take professional portraits now. And we forget that there was, there was a reason why we loved our work in the beginning, right? There was something that yeah. was excited and drew us to it that sense of adventure, that sense of going to these new places and just having fun, you know, not just plopping a tripod down in front of the Golden Gate Bridge and shooting the same thing that we've done before yeah. every single time, <laughs> but like just exploring the area and taking a photo of what inspired us and, you know, trying new stuff, like bring your crazy lights and do some light painting, have some fun, right? You know, just yeah. all this stuff that we did when we were just starting out as photographers that, you know, put your camera down in the bush, take something that's out of focus, you know, like experiment, try new things. And, you know, a lot of times it, we end up loving it. So, you know, we love it. We can't explain why. And the reason why is it's just, we never, it's, it, it kind of reconnects us with the reasons we started doing this in the first place, which are actually very easy to lose sight of if you're not careful. So yeah, beginner's mind is really important. And, you know, again, even as a, I've been a full-time professional for almost a decade here and I still try to try stuff. I mean, just, just yesterday, Tung and I were just experimenting with like, oh, we're walking down a trail with a light in different directions and see how, see if that adds to the photo. And, you know, we didn't plan it. We're just trying it see what happens. And turns out it worked really well, right? It, it looks yeah. really cool. And it's, it's a photo that I'm actually really proud of. I haven't imported it to my computer yet, but it's, you know, it's a photo that we can be really proud of and it's yeah. ours. Nobody has anything like it. So it's, and again, I, we took it because we were just having fun. We were just out there on a, we were just out there on a hike, enjoying ourselves. And that's how a lot of the best photos came. It's uh, it's easy to have a beginner's mind when you're a beginner, but right. when you, but when you're tainted with expertise, yep. how do you, how do you get yourself to be a beginner again? It's a great question. I guess, Ultimately, I mean, you don't want to forget your expertise because it's also very important, but you really have to try to just have fun. You know, it's kind of good general life advice, right? Never yeah. take anything too seriously. Take things seriously, but not too seriously, right? Like you want to, you want to do a good job, but you also want to enjoy it. And if it's feeling like work, you're not enjoying it. Right. So we yeah. definitely, we want to have those experiences again. We, you know, I try, so I try to ask myself, like, what would I have done 10 years ago here? And maybe I won't use that exact same approach because it's a lot that I've learned since then, but I'll use some of those same ideas, right? Maybe 10 years ago, I would have run down that trail with a flashlight and done crazy stuff. And it looks good. It's fun and it works and it's creative. Like there's, or, you know, maybe I would have gotten my camera down to the bushes and experimented with, you know, out of focus foregrounds. And, you know, maybe I would have blown out the sky just to try it and see what it looks like. So there are lots of things that we can do that will really help us and just experiment, have fun, especially the fact that we're shooting digital photos. You know, the delete button is right there if you see something you don't like. So just try it. What do you have to lose, right? Yeah, I guess you've honed your craft and now it's time to uh, work on the art. And, and exactly. for that, I think having a beginner's mind is key. 
Um, exactly. Let me, yeah. um, I can pull up another another set here. 